Before this episode begins, just a quick reminder that we are not professionals in any way. The views, information or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely the views of the individuals involved and by no means represent absolute facts. Opinions expressed by the hosts and guests can change at any time. Okay. Welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk About It. My name's Josh. And I'm Jacob. And in today's episode, we'll be talking about the book Man's Search for Meaning. So it was written by Austrian psychiatrist and neurologist Viktor Frankl, and it was published in 1946. To give us more information about the contents of the book, I'm going to pass it over to Jacob. Alrighty, Man's Search for Meaning begins with the introduction of logotherapy and some of the horrors and lessons learned in the concentration camps. The author, Viktor E. Frankl, tells his account of the experience endured from the beginning to end and gives his professional and personal review of it. The account begins with his train ride and talks about the crowdedness of the train and the anxious faces of the soon-to-be prisoners. There is a sign, Auschwitz, a passenger yells out in the train. The passengers from that moment onwards endure the death of of their past selves. Upon arrival, they are met with other healthy appearing prisoners which turned out to be a trick to stop the now prisoners from overreacting and to maintain order. Victor says that he noticed a carefree attitude amongst the guards and the prisoners as he was entered into camp life, and how it reassured him, but not knowing that the worst had just begun. The prisoner was directed to a side, one side the gas chamber, not knowing that at first, and the other to slave labour. The slave was to go through a process of being stripped, Naked and had to remove any items that they may have had, the prisoner was completely shaved and showered. During the showers, Victor recalls laughing with other fellow prisoners about the nakedness of themselves and how ridiculous they looked. He says, all we had was our naked existence. To any prisoner that didn't comply, was beaten and was also told if any things were found from the outside that was sewed to the clothes for hiding were to be hung. Camp days began immediately, and the prisoner was put to work. Victor tells about the thin, watery soup given for the breakfast and dinner, the ration of bread for lunch given while at work. He mentions other foods like bad-tasting sausage that was traded amongst the prisoners, using mainly cigarettes as that was the prisoner's source of currency. The prisoner often traded and it helped camp life by having a little of what they needed to get by. The work Victor talks about was mainly laying rail for the trains, but the work often changed. The prisoners had to march to and from the work sites, and whoever dropped dead from exhaustion was to be carried back by the other prisoners. To help maintain order within the camp, the camp's guard were often capos. A capo was a prisoner, trained to help out around the camp, making sure the prisoners didn't step out of line. Victor mentions that they were worse than the SS guards. In the end, Victor survived after the Allied forces pushed back enough to free the prisoners. His experiences of camp life have helped change many lives and when asked about his high sales of man search for meaning, he responded, I do not at all see in my bestseller status of my book an achievement and an accomplishment of my part, but rather an expression of the misery of our time. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of meaning, the meaning to life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. So uh, when Frankl first enters the concentration camp, he loses a manuscript that he has on him that was actually the start of a book called The Doctor and the Soul. So it was the introduction to a school of psychology called Logotherapy, Dr. Frankl came up with. And many of the tenets which are present within that school of psychology were developed through his experiences that he went through uh, while spending time in the concentration camps. So just to give you a basic understanding of what the tenets of logotherapy are, I have three of the basic tenets here. So life has meaning under all circumstances. Our main motivation for living is our will to find meaning. We have the freedom to find meaning in what we do, what we experience, or at least in the stance we take when faced with a situation of unchangeable suffering. And in fact, there's a quote here that I want to use from Victor E. Frankl where he describes psychology. So... Victor E. Frankl joked that in contrast to Freud's Freudian psychoanalysis 
and Adler's individual psychology, which are both, he considered depth psychology, which emphasizes delving into an individual's past and his or her unconscious instincts and desires. He practiced what he called height psychology, which focuses on a person's future and his or her conscious decisions and actions. His goal was to provoke people into realizing that they could exercise their capacity for choice and achieve their own goals. So in a way, it's about taking self-responsibility, realizing that at the end of the day, it is up to you. So basically what Victor goes into talking about is the breaking away from the social habitual ways that man can sort of succumb to in unconscious habits. And in the reality of being faced to concentration camps, you sort of, the individual is stuck with himself and a lot of the people that were based off of social settings no longer have what it was that they thought themselves to be, but just themselves. So there was a quote here that he states when they first get into the showers of the concentration camp. And it's, while we are here waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought home to us. We really had nothing now except our bare bodies, even minus the hair. All we possessed, literally, was our naked existence. So with logotherapy, it kind of points out the fact that even if you have nothing, you still have meaning. There is still a reason for you to be alive and there is still something that you need to go after. He talks about people in the concentration camps that got to a point where after having everything stripped away from them, they no longer felt like individuals. They no longer felt like there was a purpose for them to be here. And there was quite a common trend of when this would happen. They were all rationed cigarettes and a lot of people wouldn't smoke them. They would trade them in for soups as a way to avoid starvation. But he said you could tell when someone had lost their meaning for life because they would start smoking their cigarettes. And the whole idea was is that if I was only going to last this short time, I may as well enjoy my last moments. And so he talks about the avoidance of that mindset and kind of realizing that no matter how dire things seem, there is always a reason, there is always a meaning. And it's up to the individual to realize that meaning. And for those in camp life, that was extremely important. He talks about when it came close to Christmas time, a lot of people had it based in their heads that they'd be out of the concentration camps by Christmas and that was kind of their their meaning to live. Uh, they knew they were going to be out, they were going to be able to enjoy a nice Christmas home. But on the Christmas week, they had a massive amount of prisoners dying and the only thing they could really put it down to was just the simple fact that the, everyone had started to realise that their meanings weren't coming to fruition and they gave up. And he talks about the idea of there being a meaning to life. And I think it's extremely important. I mean, he talks about the fact that, because I think a lot of people these days, they kind of ask themselves, like, what's the meaning of life? And in a way, they kind of expect an answer. But one of the things that Frankel goes into into this book is the fact that you shouldn't be asking life, what's the meaning? At the end of the day, life asks you every day, what's your meaning? Yeah. I mean, you can't avoid life. Yeah. You're in life. You're yeah. surrounded by life. Yeah. You're a part of life. And I've got a quote here that goes into it a bit more. But as each situation in life represents a challenge to man and presents a problem for him to solve, the question of the meaning of life may eventually be reversed. Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of life is, but rather he must recognize that he is the one who is asked. In a word, Each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering to his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. Thus, logotherapy sees the responsibleness, the very essence of human existence. So yeah, like I said, the whole idea is that life quite literally owes you nothing, and I think that's quite an important lesson. And I think it's important to realize that it is completely up to you. I think the reason that... I mean, we look at people and we look at every other animal and I think the one thing that does determine the difference between man and every other animal is that we are a self-determining creature. At the end of the day, it is up to us what we get up and do in the morning. We no longer follow traditions. We're human beings and it's quite different for us. We quite literally can achieve something if we really want to. Yeah. I mean, we quite literally determine our own future. It is up to us. It just depends on whether or not you're willing to do the things to get there. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where the idea of having suffering that's worth going through comes from. Frankel likes to reference Nietzsche quite a bit throughout the book. And one of the quotes that was like 
well, it was really good for me uh, was the quote from Nietzsche that was, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. I think that's really important. It's the idea that if you have a reason to do something, I mean, for example, say just going to the gym. Why does someone go to the gym? Because they have a goal. Yeah. They want to get bigger. They want to get smaller, depending on what it is. You know, you've all got your own goals. But going to the gym isn't a walk through the park. It's not easy. You gotta suffer. But you don't really see it as suffering if you know at the end of the day you've a reason to do it. Yeah. I mean, some people love going to the gym. They love it. It doesn't change what they do at the gym. They're still doing the same thing as every other person, but they love to do it. Why? Because they have a reason to do it. They have a why. So therefore they bear the how. And in fact, the how, for some weird reason, becomes enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think it's the same thing with working hard. And I think because he talks about the existential vacuum, which is something that I personally kind of, when he was talking about it, I was like, you know, there's parts of my life where I could 100% relate to that. Um, and I think other people can too. I've got a quote here about the uh, existential vacuum. So yeah. the existential vacuum is a widespread phenomenon of the 20th century. This is understandable. It may be due to a twofold loss in which man has had to undergo since he became a truly human being. At the end of the beginning of human history, man lost some of its basic animal instincts and in which an animal behavior is embedded and by which it is secured. Such security, like paradise, is now closed to man forever, for man has to make choices. No instinct tells him what to do and no tradition tells him what he ought to do. Sometimes he doesn't even know what he wishes to do. Instead, he wishes to do what other people do, conformism, or he does what other people wish him to do, totalitarianism. The existential vacuum manifests itself mainly in the state of boredom. We can now understand Schopenhauer when he said that mankind was apparently doomed to, to facilitate between two extremes of distress and boredom. In actual fact, boredom is now causing and certainly bringing to psychiatrists more problems to resolve than distress. Yeah. What I like about that is that from my own from my own experience and stuff, I used to, when it came to figuring out what my why was, I always searched for things that were outside of me instead of what was, what could be done inside me, inside of me. And where I can relate with that is that you sort of just go for the simplest things. What, what would, what would be the end result? What is something I don't have to work for, but I can see other people have. So like, you know, if it was social relations and stuff, I would only work towards what the group was doing in order to fit in. But it's just like, what quality did I bring? Because if I didn't have a why to live, then what was there for me to offer? There was nothing great that I was offering. So when it came to actually sorting myself out, I began to realize that a lot of the habits that I had taken on board or taken to consider to be me weren't actually me that were just a bunch of habits that I had taken on and given to others or social groups to quite quite literally fit in so it wasn't until I started actually figuring out that I wanted to do something with my life that I realized that okay I'm not so worried about what how people see me socially but more or less what I have to offer to others through what I have learned and through what I have suffered that actually becomes a lot more thing that things become more interesting within a conversation if you actually bring something to the table i mean like a lot of the time people just sort of talk about the the small things that you know i do i do this to make myself feel this and it's just like don't do that to feel that do yeah. that to get to that yeah be something be who it is that you want to be you know you might be scared to lose what you have now but at the end what you have worked for yeah. might be so much more important than what you have right now. And my question is, is it really losing anything if the end result of getting rid of that thing is a positive? I mean, what have you actually lost? No, you haven't lost anything. You haven't lost anything. Yeah, I mean, it may, yeah, it may feel like you're losing something at the time. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you'll have more than what you would have had if you'd continued down that same road. I mean, this is also where another quote in the book comes in when he talks about uh, the existential vacuum, which I think a lot of people can probably relate to. I know I can. Uh, but he talks about the various ways in which an existential vacuum kind of shows itself. And I mean, for example, sometimes the frustrated will to find meanings vicariously compensated by the will to find power. So in other words, he talks about the idea that if you have no meaning 
in some ways your meaning can just be having almost dominance over someone else like that that becomes your meaning at the end of the day uh, he also talks about how it can come in the form to find power um but in that he's talking the will to have money so some people become workaholics they have yeah. no reason for their work they don't know what they're doing they just know that at the end of the day if the money's in their bank account that's all that happens and that's good don't get me wrong it's all it's good to be it's good to have a whole, like a hard work ethic and everything but at the end of the day i think it is a truism that money doesn't bring you happiness and i think if money was going to be be what brings you to some sort of happiness it should be the byproduct of what it was to get to your objective and that mm. was the thing that happened because yeah. of it <laughs> yeah exactly and then also the final or the third way he says that it kind of manifests itself is in sexual compensation but i also think that with the modern day there are a few other ways that it kind of brings itself into the equation like for example when you get home just chuck on the netflix yeah. it's like well, why'd you do that because oh, it's nice okay i mean i think about that because i do the same thing so i get home and i'll just fucking chuck on netflix or you know do something like that and at the end of that netflix session i haven't actually achieved anything i don't feel any better per se afterwards during it i feel great but there was no purpose to that there was no reason for me to do that it was because i had nothing else no other reason to do anything else that i kind of resorted to what gave me pleasure which is what he talks about with sexual compensation is the whole idea that you compensate this emptiness feeling with pleasure and this book was written a while ago and at the time that would have been sex and it's i think it's still i think it's still relates to today because yeah, you, you, <laughs> you know you've got those those fucking 1 a.m texts where it's like hey you up <laughs> it's like well because you're up at 1 a.m bored as fuck and it's like well sure can't bro, write come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i guess i'm by myself <laughs> no, no but um and it's the same thing it's every time you jump on social media every time you jump on netflix it's that dopamine hit it's that feeling of pleasure that you can get instantly straight up done but at the end of the day what are you actually achieving by scrolling through the social media apps for fucking hours on end. I mean, the, the amount of hours people spend watching Netflix and like, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm a fucking saint. I'm not. I'm guilty of these things myself. All because I know about them doesn't mean I'm immune to them. Yeah. But I think it's good to be able to look at yourself and go, why am I doing this? And if you can understand why, you can get to a how. Yeah. Can I just add to that quickly? Because there's some things that I notice amongst other people and stuff and it's that there's a, there's a new trend that and I'm guilty of it as well. And that's, uh, oh yeah, I've got, I don't spend as much time on Facebook. I don't f spend as much time on Instagram. Like, and it's sort of like this social thing, like, huh? <laughs> You're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, like, I barely spend that much time on social media now. But it's just like, what have you done to actually change that? Like, what, yeah. what has taken that spot? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just like, is anything else important happening? Yeah. Like, are you working towards something? And yeah. I'm not, I'm not taking a hit at people, but, because I'm too guilty of it, but it's that oh, I can have that social gain. Like, yeah. I'm edgy. <laughs> yeah. I'm a cool kid. Well, it's like quite literally all my social media is in it. Like my apps folder is called a waste of time. And it's like, yeah, that's cool and all. But if I close that social media app just to jump on Netflix, I haven't changed yeah. anything. I'm still sitting on a screen doing nothing. Yeah. All I've done is change the vice I use to waste my time. Yeah. I mean, it's... You haven't changed anything. Yeah, I mean, don't look at... I'm going to say this so many times from this point through, but as I always say, don't look at what something says it does, look at what it actually does. If you say, oh, I've spent less time on social media, but then you've spent more time on Netflix or vice versa, you haven't actually changed anything. You might as well just keep doing what you were yeah, doing it's like, before. It's like, a meth, it's like a meth addict going, oh, I don't do meth anymore. I do heroin. It's like, <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. You got off the, oh, fuck. Funny. It's like, you've, you've changed. You haven't really changed anything. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, and this, and this is where I like notice that it does, it is a social, a social uh, superior type thing because instead of coming to me with, I'd no longer sit on that or barely watch TV and stuff. It's just like, perhaps instead you would just come up to me with a conversation of what you're actually doing instead. yeah exactly you wouldn't need if you were so fulfilled in what you were actually doing you wouldn't need to brag about what you weren't doing yeah to try and justify yeah. yourself yeah 
I mean, if you were, if what you were doing was so useful outside of what you're not doing, would that not be the first thing you would lead on with? Yeah. Obviously, if it falls behind not being on social media, then it's probably not that useful. Yeah. It's probably not that helpful. Yeah. You probably know within yourself that you haven't actually improved. Yeah. But you found a way to make it sound like you have, and that feels good. Yeah. But it doesn't actually achieve anything. I mean, it's also the idea that none of these none of these activities we're listing involve any sort of struggle whatsoever. You can quite literally sit on your ass, lay in your bed and just scroll yeah. or watch. It involves no struggle whatsoever. I think, you know, some people might hear, oh, struggle, like, why would I want to struggle? There is, I don't see any point in struggling. But, and I know this from personal experience, but I have to question, when you go, look, when you look back on your life and you think about the things that taught you a life lesson or really changed the way you thought about something or, really had an effect on who you were as a person. Usually they have to do with some amount of struggle you went through. Mm. And you're proud of that. You're proud that you got through whatever that was. Maybe it's maybe you lost weight. Maybe it was a toxic relationship. Maybe it was an illness. And you came out the other side and you felt like a stronger person because of it. But why do you feel that way? It's because you suffered and you went through that suffering and you now realize that there was a reason for that suffering. Yeah. Now on some, in some of those cases, you may not even realize at the time that there was a reason for that suffering. But now that you've come out the other end and you've gone, you know what, there was a reason for that. That was, even though it was shitty at the time, like a lot of people go through shitty shit. But when they look back on it, they'd go, you know what? If I could change anything, I wouldn't. Yeah. I, would, I would go through that all over again because it makes me who I am. It's yeah. taught me the things that I know today yeah. and it's made me a better person. And it's funny how these things that you wouldn't change, because I'm sure there are plenty of other things that you would change that have nothing to do with suffering. But these things that you would not change have to do with suffering. But also the funny thing is it doesn't make anybody envious of you. They're not things that people would be like, oh, I wish I had that or I wish I could do that. It's like, no, these are things that nobody else wants. You happen to be given it or get it We'll have to go through it. And it's the fact you got through it that it was worth it. Or even if you're still going through it, you can see that there's a purpose in that. And I think that's really where logotherapy really comes into it. It's the whole idea that you can look at your situation now and it may be dog shit, but if you can go into a dog shit situation with your head held high and keep your morals and not become a shitty person because of it, I think that's one of the greatest achievements you can have. Yeah. And you will look back on that and be like, you know what? Fuck yeah. I did that. Yeah. That was me. And I'm a better person because of it. Yeah. And if you compare something like that to sitting on Netflix and doing nothing, even though it's not the suffering, you don't have to suffer. It's nowhere near as rewarding. Yeah. I mean, I know there's plenty of times I get up from watching Netflix and shit. And I'm like, what did I, why did I do that? There was literally no purpose to that. I achieved yeah. nothing. What do I have to show for that? Yeah. The answer is nothing. Yeah. Nah thing yeah so my question is at the end of the day and i know it's fucking it's super stereotypical to say oh you only live once so you know really live it up but at the end of the day you quite literally just get this and this is it yeah maybe there's something after this but we don't know but you know what you do know you're alive right fucking now yeah you have the opportunity to go through some shit to make you a better person or to strive to be a better person but have to go through some shit to get there yeah and, you know, even like, even studying, just fucking pushing through those assignments and shit, that's a struggle. But if you can get through them with your head held high, not mope about it, just get fucking through it. Yeah. That attitude is going to carry over. And you're going to go into other parts of your life with that exact same attitude. And it's going to show in your personality. You're going to be a better person because of it. And at the end of the day, that was caused by you struggling. And struggling brings a meaning and i think it brings some of the deepest meanings that we find throughout our lives and i think if you are struggling at least find some meaning within it if you do not have a meaning see a lot of the time when people and i know this from my own experience is that when you get into a real depressive and just a real bad state that you sort of develop this nihilistic view of the world and uh you kind of look around and you just see that there is no meaning to it at all. Look, 
when it comes to truth, there really isn't any meaning. I mean, like, if you were to step out of your skin, which is quite impossible, <laughs> so don't be nihilistic. <laughs> um, yeah, that there is no meaning in the world. I mean, like, but you are here anyway. You can't convince me, like, you can try and convince me that there is no meaning in the world, but wh why am I here? I c if there was no meaning, then I may as well just finish it. I may as well just end it off right now. Yeah, if, if there was that, no meaning, why haven't you killed yourself? Yet? If if I'm if I'm that intelligent to realize that there is absolute no meaning, then why am I still standing here? So yeah. when it gets to that situation, I think what what isn't killing you, or what's making you not kill yourself, is a good start to figuring out how much more you can elaborate mm. on finding purpose. So going out, going out into the world and having a reason for your sufferings and building upon that to getting to where you wish to be is going to be a very difficult journey, but one that is very rewarding in the end. And from where I used to stand in my own mind and where I stand now, and don't get me, don't get me wrong, like I'm still I'm still going through the wars, I'm still learning, but at the moment it's just like I kind of kind of feel better knowing that it doesn't have no reason within it because in the end it makes me a better person not just towards myself but untowards others mm. and therefore I have something to give to others when it comes to having these conversations I have something to offer to the other to other people that don't know how to quite handle this situation so I love what you're saying about like you know going into detail about you know try and find find meaning within the suffering because it quite literally is true. Yeah. Yeah, so so throughout the book, Viktor Frankl talks pretty heavily on the ideas of finding the why for why you're here and taking responsibility for yourself. So at the very beginning of the book, um, it starts with Viktor Frankl saying that quite often when he was talking to new patients, the first thing he would ask is why haven't you killed yourself yet? And it's a good question. I mean, if life was completely meaningless, like, for example, how nihilism sees it, what would be the point in living? Why haven't you killed yourself yet? There is no point for you to be here, so why are you still here? Obviously, there's something keeping you here. And he talks about his job of finding out what that is yeah. and finding out the why for why you're here. I think that's an important idea because a lot of people these days feel like they don't have a why. They're kind of here, they're stuck here, they don't want to be here. There's no point, there's no meaning. You know, compared to the whole universe, I'm a tiny little speck, I don't matter either way. Okay, but you are here. You can't change, I mean, you could change that fact, but you haven't. So if you're still here, obviously there's a reason. Because, say with everything else in life, why do you go to the shops? Or because there's a reason you want to get something from that shop. Well, it's the same thing with life. Why are you living life? Well, obviously you want to get something out of it. Otherwise you wouldn't bother with it in the first place. And so with the whole logotherapy and finding a why, it's, it's about the idea of finding out why you're here and working off of that to build the life you need to get there or to achieve what you want to achieve. Live out that why. So I guess uh, what we want to talk about is how to elaborate on the question itself. How do we find out what our why is? In terms, you could ask yourself, why isn't it that you haven't killed yourself? But also from another perspective that I like to take as well is that a lot of the time when it comes to decision making, a lot of the decisions you do make in a given situation will be based off of the motivations for why you would be doing it in the first place. So what it, what it comes down to figuring out what is your why, taking a chance on yourself, but actually doing something. So if you're someone that just lounges around, do, does nothing, and you're coming to the point where it's just like, I do not know what the point of life is, or you become nihilistic, just doing something is a good start to figuring out what it is that you want to do. I think what comes through to us when we actually do something is that the thing that we are meant to be doing with ourselves begins to shine through. 
paying enough attention to one's actions and behaviours in any given situation can often show who it is that you are meant to be. Hmm. Well, yeah, I guess it's kind of weird because so you talk you talk about the idea of you assess your own actions and you will be able to find something within those actions that may give you some sort of bearing yeah. as to where you want to go. Part of me would almost argue the opposite. Okay. Because if you're questioning that action in the first place, obviously you're not happy with it. Yeah. And can, can sorry. Yeah. Can I elaborate on that also? Yeah. Is that to only say the, to only say that what you physically do as an action is to be considered an, considered an action, an action to what you think of how you feel about that given action can be something that you can monitor as well. Because yeah, if you're yeah. thinking in disagreement with yeah. with the given situation and how you reacted to it, then there's, so, there's something within you that is calling to another truth. Yeah. So investigating that truth yeah. that is coming through to you in the disagreement of the action that you are either thinking or doing, yeah. then that needs to be investigated on because yeah. that's where truth lies. And I think also it's like sometimes you can do an action and during the action, you don't necessarily disagree with it. Mm. Like while you're doing it, you're not sitting there thinking to yourself, I shouldn't be doing this. Sometimes it's once, it might be the next day, it might be the next week. You look back at what you've done and you're like, huh. You know, looking back, I'm not happy with that. That didn't feel right. It doesn't feel like that that's where I, that's what I should have done. And it's funny how you can feel that that's, that's not what you should have done. And yet you go ahead and do it anyway. And it's like, okay, if you're able to identify once that that's not what you should have done. And then you go ahead and do it again. And then you think to yourself, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. And you feel shit because you went and did that thing when you felt like you shouldn't have. It kind of becomes this cycle of, I did an action. It felt good while I was doing it. Afterwards, I felt like shit because I knew I shouldn't have done that you know what you could do? It's, it's a wild idea. It's a wild idea. You know, hold me back. You could take responsibility and stop that cycle from happening again. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just pointing it out there. I'm just pointing, and, look, and look, and it sounds simple. It sounds like the easiest thing you could ever fucking do. But if it was the easiest thing you could ever fucking do, why doesn't everyone do it? Because in reality, breaking that habit, I mean, if you're not happy with it and yet you do it all the time, it's a bad habit. But habits are hard to break. Yeah. And it takes effort. Yeah. And it takes being responsible. Yeah. You've got to be responsible for your own actions. Yeah. If you sit there and go, oh, I didn't feel good, but, you know, oh, maybe next time. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, next time comes around. And the same thing happens. And you go, oh, well, maybe tomorrow. Well, no. How about next time before the action takes place? Like, I, for me personally, and look, I'm, I'm not a saint. I fall victim to this all the fucking time. I mean, the quote that all because you know about something doesn't mean you're immune to it, I think is key. Because you can educate yourself all you fucking want. You can know about all these things. You can know all the social tricks in the book. You can know about all the triggers that are going to make you feel certain ways. But if you don't do anything, of, of course you're going to fall victim to them. Mm. You're not making an effort not yeah. to. And the problem is that to change that takes short-term struggle. And struggle's not nice. The feeling of struggling is not a good feeling. That's why it's called struggling. Yeah. If it wasn't, if it wasn't a bad feeling, you wouldn't call it struggling. But that's when the whole idea of having a why comes into it. Yeah. Because it's the idea that if you have a why, that struggling is no longer struggling. Or if it, I'm actually not, no, it is still struggling because it doesn't actually change what you're doing. You're still doing the same activity. You're still taking part in the same thing. But instead of it being this senseless, oh, well, I'm going to do it because, I don't know, it makes, me, it makes me feel better about myself. That's, that's not a sustainable thing because the struggling for no reason, eventually you're going to be like, well, why, why would I even, why would I, it's not, it's not for anything. 
why don't I just go back to what I was doing before? Felt nice. Yeah, and I think that's where that nihilistic view can come into, into yeah, that situation. Yeah, yeah, it's the whole idea that, look, I can struggle and I can change myself, but what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, you could argue that the world doesn't matter and that the people on the world don't matter and that nothing matters. Yeah. But you still live on the world. You still live your entire life here with other people, with yourself. Things still hurt. Things still feel good. All because something doesn't matter doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect. Like, sure, if I reached across this table and punched you in the face, (laughs) in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter. But for right here, right now... I'm going to fucking kill you. Exactly. (laughs) It would matter a lot. It would matter a lot. And... It's the whole idea that it's like, well, actually, I don't want to take the responsibility to have to change anything because if I do, like, what's what's the point? And it's like, well, why not try? Mm. Why not see if it? Why not see if it matters? You're saying it doesn't matter off of the idea that obviously the life you're living right now doesn't matter. Well, maybe it could matter, and maybe it doesn't need to matter to you. Maybe it could matter to someone else. Maybe what you do with your life will benefit someone else, and maybe that was. Maybe that's the meaning. Maybe that's why it has meaning. Because maybe you've made someone else's life better. Yeah. Maybe you did something that had a positive effect on someone. Yeah. So I, like, I 100% agree with you in that. Absolutely. Very true. I think if you're going to look at the world as having no purpose itself, then instead of just being here to go for the easiest thing, why not go for the hardest thing? Take up the impossible and see what you can make possible. Yeah. Wouldn't that mean something to be more proud of in this nihilistic view? Yeah. Doing the impossible, taking up that as a why or whatever it is that you choose to do that may be considered impossible. Take up that as your why. Lay yourself down on that why. Yeah, and it doesn't even need to be impossible to the grand scheme of things, just impossible to you. Yeah. Like, if you look at something, you're like, oh, there's no way I could achieve that. Well, no fucking shit. Not with a mindset like that, you dumb fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, just why not? Yeah. I mean, people ask why. It's like, oh, well, why would I? It's like, well, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, because it, it, it's a struggle. Well, every day's a fucking struggle. Let's be real. Yeah. Like, you get up in the morning and say, for example, if you have to go to work, it's not pleasant. You still do it. But if you have a reason to do it, it may just be a little bit more pleasant. Yeah. Maybe it'll be a little bit more enjoyable. Why? Because you know at the end of the day that it's working towards something bigger. Yeah. It's working towards something. It's working towards an image of yourself or a place you want to be or somewhere you see in your head, future you. Making your want, you're making your want to wants your wants, making that future version of you that you see as being better a reality. Yeah. And the thing is, to get there, that that space between you and that person that you want to be, that's struggle street, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta go through that shit. Yeah. You don't the reason you're this is the thing. If being that person you wanted to be was so easy, why aren't you already that person? Yeah. It's because it's not easy. Yeah. And that's why you want to be that person. That's why you want to be that person. It's not, it's not easy to get there. Mm. It's going to be a struggle, but it might just be worth it. Yeah. It might just mean something. Exactly. And I think where you're actually going with that, and this, this is another thing that people have their want to wants, and when it comes to actually striving for it, it's almost impossible. Let's just say, for example, someone wants to find friends. And all they do is look for friends, but they just cannot seem to find any friends. Now, that in itself can be a struggle because if all you are searching for is finding friends, then when it actually comes to making a friend, all you have to offer is looking for friends. (laughs) (laughs) Please, please be my... I have nothing to offer to you, but please be my friend. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes down to actually like... You know, yeah, you may want to have friends, but perhaps finding something to offer to those friends Mm. as 
I don't know, like, I like sitting on computers and you mm. find another group that likes to sit on computers, computers and boom. stuff. You know, it's that easy. Yeah. But it's probably going to be hard. Actually, you might find it in this day and age. <laughs> yeah, someone that. But that's the thing. I mean, like, I, I think if you're going to look at what it is that you're actually striving for, you need to actually ask yourself, is it achievable on its own or is it achievable as a counterpart to something bigger? Yeah. So, you know, if, like, for instance, this podcast, you know, we got into wanting to do this podcast purely because what we were talking about was really cool, fun. Yeah. And perhaps the byproduct of that was... Helping people. Helping people. And people became interested and maybe people want to talk to us and we gain friends out of yeah. it. It's just the byproduct exactly. of having something it's, to offer. It's not the main it, it, It's not the main goal. It's because we want to offer something and have people offer something to us. Yeah. It's just something that happens to come along with it. Yeah. And I think that's a problem with maybe certain wires that people have is it's the wires are subs. It's like a little subset of what the bigger cause is. Yeah. And because of that, you get stuck chasing this little thing and you don't achieve it. And so what happens? You go, well, I can't, I can't achieve this basic thing. Why would I try? If I can't even, if I'm not even good at this. It's like, well, okay, but there's a million fucking other things you could be trying. Like, all because you fail once doesn't mean you should just lay there and be like, well, fuck it, I tried. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I remember I, I used to be a door-to-door salesman. If I, if I stopped my working day the first time someone said no to me, I wouldn't get past the first fucking door. <laughs> <laughs> my, my work day would have been... A minute and a half flat. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. less, depending on how fast they slam that door. And no was your warm up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that was it. And that was like why I really enjoyed that job. Um, was the whole idea that being told no, there are certain aspects of life you shouldn't take this mentality to. But every no gets you closer to a yes. And I like that idea because you can try something and if you fuck up, if you fail, if some shit doesn't go your way. Try again. Because then that's one fuck up out of the way. If you knew if you knew how many fuck ups it would take you to achieve something, you'd probably more being you'd be more inclined to get through the fuck ups, would you not? Yeah. If if someone said to you, Okay, you're gonna fuck up five times and then you'll get it, you'd be like, Oh fuck it, all right, I'll fuck up five times and I'm guaranteed to get it. Yeah. In a way, achieving your meaning has the same thing. It's if there are an amount of fuck ups it'll take for you to achieve that. You don't know how many fuck ups that is, but there is a number. There will be a number. You will get to a certain fuck up and then go, actually, you know what? I've, I've achieved what I want. And maybe once you get to your why, maybe you find another why. And the thing is, that why wouldn't have even been a why you could have seen before you achieved <laughs> yes, that first one. You wouldn't yes. even know it existed. Yep. You'd be like, oh, there's no, like, you thought your original why was like, oh, that's fucking odd. The why that your why sees is going to be like, fuck, bro. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Like, fuck. Yeah. And why wouldn't you want to do? Why wouldn't you want to do that? It's the prerequisite why. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you finished one course. Now it's on to the fucking master's yeah, degree. Exactly. It's like, yeah. Why would you not want to do that? Absolutely. So, basically, I mean, like, what we've covered is good. I think. I think that's basic understanding of what it is that you need to know or how to find your why yeah and i think look literally it's with anything and i know it's so fucking stereotypical but the first step is the hardest just making that decision just saying to yourself you know what i'm not happy not happy with who i am maybe i'm not happy with the situation i'm in maybe i don't know maybe it's the maybe it's your relationship maybe it's you something you're gonna go i'm not happy with this it's not, I'm, I'm not serving myself in any way, shape or form. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. Well, why not change it? Why not, why not do something different? If that's not working out for you and you don't like the result it's giving you, then why do you continue to do it? I mean, that's quite literally the definition of, fuck, what is it the definition of? There's a certain, de- is it insanity or stupidity? 
that's got me stumped. But the whole idea is that if you repeat, if you repeat the same process over and over again and expect a different result, you're just in a loop. You just, I mean, why would you expect a different result? Yeah. It's the same shit over yeah. and over again. Why, yeah. why would it change? Why yeah. should it change? Yeah. You haven't changed, so why yeah. should your situation Absolutely. change? Absolutely. And that's it. If you're not happy with your situation, if you're not happy with the situation you're in, it can't change if you don't change. Yeah. Why should it? What does that situation owe to you? Yeah. I mean, it's not. It doesn't owe you shit. Yeah. It does. Life doesn't owe you shit. It's up to you to change you. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing. Right. When you begin to question your actions and motivations, it's, it's probably best to actually open up or elaborate on the things of what it is that you are actually questioning. Right. Because for you to have that thought in the first place is good enough to question it. Right. So whatever it is that brings you to question that, maybe something within you that needs to happen in order for you to be more of you. So in other words, you're like, there's a little part of you that's coming out and saying, hey, yeah, this ain't it. Yeah. But you've got to find out where the rest of that person is and what it, wh- why is it that they've decided to come out now yeah. and say to you, hey, no, nah, this isn't on. I don't like this. Why? Mm-hmm. Why has that happened now? And should you ignore it? Or should you try and figure out what that is? Yeah. So I, I guess I guess investigating that, that's beginning to come out, will help you better understand what it is that you are doing now that doesn't mm. sort of align itself properly. So let's just say, for example, you are an insecure person. Right. And a lot of the times that you feel that you are most insecure... And if you're in a situation where you are talking to somebody, then a lot of the insecurities that you have around yourself or that you may think people have around you, then a lot of your responses will be based off of what it is that has you to this insecurity. So a lot of the habits that you take on into your life may not actually be your habit. I mean, like there will be your habits, but would it be your habits who you really are or is it just something that you could possibly be insecure to that makes you project it into the world so i guess what i'm trying to say is if you are feeling that you are doing things that make you feel like you don't want to do that but you find yourself doing it to defend yourself because I mean, like social situ- social situations from the ego perspective is that it's kind of survival. So if you're trying to survive in a social situation and you feel like you have to defend yourself all the time, yeah. then perhaps it's probably a situation you should question. Yeah. And what it is that's making you feel like you should have to question it in the first place. Yeah. Because whatever is driving you to the need to defend yourself isn't making you any more of you it's only bringing out something that is outside of you that you cannot control yeah so when it comes to actually being you or whatever that actually is we're all finding that out the you you want to be or the you that you should be one the, the you that is trying to get itself out there to not defend itself letting that come out and seeing what it is that you're currently doing to what it is that you want to be doing yeah, and figuring out what it is that you can make the thing that's coming out for you to be your why so that way you can carry it on into this world. And even even noticing the little individual habits and changing those, even even if that doesn't cause you to find your why, Let's say you, you find a habit, you don't like it, but you're not really sure why you don't like it, but you decide to change it. Changing it is going to make you a more adapted person to achieve your why. Yeah. I mean, that one difference is going to make you a little bit closer to either finding out or achieving a why. And let's say that one leads to you going, well, actually, you know what? Since I've done this, I feel a little bit different. There's something else I don't like. I want to change that too. And let's say you do that two or three times and then you start to realize, actually, you know what? There is a reason. There is a why. And I'm starting to find it. And you know what? Maybe you have found it. Well, if you have found it, you've got to ask yourself, well, 
if I want to achieve this why, what else do I need to change? Because it's probably not going to only be three things. Yeah. There's probably going to be a whole fucking range of things yeah. that you need to change in order to achieve that why. And yeah. maybe your why changes. Maybe you don't know what your why is. I mean, even Viktor Frankl goes into it that no person can understand the meaning of life, their entire life, until they're dead or on the deathbed. Because life, it's like a movie. You're living out individual frames. If you were to take a frame out of a movie and put it by itself, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, what does this mean? What's, what's the meaning of this? It doesn't make any sense. But when you take that frame and you put it in a movie, it makes sense within the movie. That frame is meant to be there. There is a purpose for that frame. Now, you haven't seen the whole movie. You don't know how the movie ends, but yet that frame still has meaning. Yeah. Victor said, life is like the movie. Each one of those frames have meaning. There is a meaning to every single one of them. They may not be the exact same meaning, but they all serve a greater meaning. So at the end of your life, you can look back and be like, you know what? There was a meaning to all that, and this is it. Yeah. But you won't know that until you're on your deathbed or you're yeah. dead. And he talks about why the individual needs to find the meaning in each one of those frames for themselves. Because at the end of the day, it's your meaning. Yeah. I can't tell you what your meaning is. Why? Because I'm not you. Well, actually, I do like where you're going with this, and I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. Because I don't think you can. You don't. I don't think you actually have to. Then again, I agree, but I disagree at right. some point. You don't have to get to the end of your life to look back and see where it is that that meaning is going. Because if you're finding yourself at a situation where you do not like where it is that you're going and you find out what that meaning is, that whatever that thing is that's coming through to you to say, yeah, this is not the way that we want to be going, then wouldn't it be good to look back on what you have currently done and see from that, from those frames to what, the current meaning is heading to and if you were to change today what from the moment you see it from you looking back to whatever whenever the time you can remember yeah then something would eventually begin to come through you would probably find where these habits begin to yeah show up and to where they are now so you're sort of getting a rough estimate of where it is that you're heading at that point a rough estimate you don't know exactly you have an idea. Okay, you have an idea. You have okay. an idea. Okay, you have an idea of where it will be heading. But at the end of the life, you will know. You will know. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you have so an idea what I'm saying of where is, it is yeah. going. But if you were to change that yeah. or just start deciding to start to decide start deciding to change that, yeah. then you can start going, Okay, this is what I need to do to get to that next part in my life so when you actually do look back on it yeah you will see a a broader perspective all the parts come together yep but at the current situation where you're not seeing it it's almost like you're hitting pause to that moving going okay we need to evaluate exactly so So each frame has meaning okay it's up to you to decide well not to decide but to find out well in a way it is for you to decide yeah because like i said i can't choose what your meaning is yeah you can't choose what my meaning is why because i'm me yeah i know myself better than anyone you know yourself better than anyone. you have to walk in those shoes you have to walk in your own shoes and figure out why am i doing this yeah. why do i not want to do this and where do i want to go yeah and only you can draw on your past experience yeah. and only you can draw on what you want your future to be yeah that's all on you and you know what that's a fuck ton of responsibility and it's up to you to take it. Yeah. So that pretty much covers it. I mean, like, it just goes to show how much, like, his idea can expand, not just inside of a concentration camp, but into everyday life. Yeah. So I think we should leave it, up, leave it to there and let the, to let, allow the listeners to make their own decisions about how they feel about what we've said and what, and the ideas that Victor has put forward. So I think that's it. (laughs) Uh, So that wraps up the episode, guys. So thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.
Take care.